and the methods and the classes, which has got absolutely nothing to do with object-oriented programming, absolutely everything to do with abstract data types. Okay, and abstract data types are a good idea, but they are not the essence of object-oriented programming. The essence of object-oriented programming is message passing, and that message has been forgotten. So in fact, uh, uh, I used to, I wrote a paper, sort of, or a sort of web blog thing, which I thought, why, why object-oriented programming is silly. Um, I thought it was a silly idea. Years later, people say, do you mind if I use this in your lecture course? Yeah, I've got students sort of discussing it. Um, and I did at the time, this was about 1980 or 85, I thought object-oriented programming was a silly idea. Until many years later, when my thesis supervisor said, well, Joe, no, you're completely wrong. He said, object-oriented programming isn't silly, but Erlang is the only object-oriented programming language, and all the rest aren't object-oriented. And I said, oh, is that right? <laughs> and uh, we talked for a bit, and then, yeah, he was right, actually, because Erlang is, is actually the only object-oriented programming language, and all the rest aren't. Um, <laughs> they say they are. And that's because Erlang has two things. It has, well, it has the three things that are essential to object-oriented programming. One is message passing. The second thing that's essential is encapsulation, um, isolation. Um, if you write software, and I write software, and we put them on the same machine, if your software crashes my software, it's not very good. Okay. Um, it doesn't matter if you've proved that your code is correct, if my code can come and crash your code. You see, pull the plug out. It's like turning the electricity off or something. It's not a good idea. You need strong encapsulation, strong isolation mm -hmm. between the components. And the third thing you need is uh, some notion of polymorphism. Polymorphic means uh, that all objects will respond to the same protocol. So, for example, all objects might sort of turn yourself into a string, print yourself. You know, you can send a print me message to any object and it will print itself or it turn itself into a string or it will serialize itself. And the reason for the poly why polymorphic is good it's for the poor old programmer, because the programmer can't remember all these, you know, you don't want all the methods for different objects to have different names everywhere. So making things polymorphic helps an awful lot. So Erlang's got all of these things. Message passing, um, it's got strong isolation, uh, and it's polymorphic, which is something that no other programming language has, as far as I'm aware. Uh, and even in Erlang, the isolation is 100%. Well, it is if you have an Erlang application where the two things run on completely different computers than, than, than the isolation property um, works. <coughs> right, which is the idea of messaging. And uh, actually, the whole idea of messaging, the interprocessor message in the past, seems to have been invented by Per Brinch Hansen. Because I asked Jim Gray, and he said, Who invented this stuff? And uh, he mailed me back and said, Well, Think, I think it was Pear Brinch Hansen, so he didn't really know because he was one of the people who was responsible for that. So the nice thing about message passing is it decouples the sender from the receiver. Okay, so once you've sent your message, it sort of vanishes into the into the ether, and the receiver is now decoupled from the sender. So it doesn't inherit all the ills that the sender has got. Okay, and it's in a different language. It's in a universal language. Um, if we message pass with universal languages, if I, I'm using English now, it's kind of universal language. If we message pass with universal languages, uh, it's very good, because we, we, we can have a dictionary. We understand what words mean. We look it up in the dictionary. That's what the meaning of these things are. But we don't couple the sender and the receiver together. So if I'm dying of an infectious disease, and I talk to you, or send you, you know, use Morse code, you don't get that infectious disease. So I die, and then, but you carry on, so, so it's okay. Right. Oh, yes. You know, you know where that is. That's the most isolated place in the world. Tristan de Kuna. <coughs> Isolation. Um, my program should not <coughs> crash your program. That's just about the most important property that a program can have. It should be actually impossible for you to crash my program. Okay? So you can discount any programming language, any operating system where it's actually possible to crash something else. This should be a law of nature. So, I've said this already. This is one of the great ideas of computer science, the message passing. 
because it enforces isolation. If A and B are isolated, and you send messages, then A and B can't crash A. Okay. Now, isolation is very important. If I, if, I, if the physical world is, you know, objects in it are isolated. If I, if I take your computer and smash it, you know, bang, can I smash your computer, please? <laughs> no, okay, okay. It wouldn't, it wouldn't affect this computer. Yeah. Software doesn't work like that. <laughs> you know? There was a definition of distributed programming is when a program that you never knew about running on a machine you've never heard of crashes stops your computer. <clears throat> it's a really good idea. Okay. And uh, object oriented programming came about through two motivations. One was, one was this scale. Thing. How can we make large software systems? How can we build them? Okay, this implies some sort of abstract thing, like some modularization. And it implies getting encapsulation right. So that's, that's the most important thing you do. Getting encapsulation right. Getting things to talk to That's what We've got encapsulation right today, but we haven't got talking together right. I'll show you why it's wrong. Um, isolation is needed for fault tolerance. Um, if things are completely isolated, they are, you know, almost by definition fault tolerant. If I have two computers, I have one computer here, another computer in Australia, if I break my computer here, it doesn't break the computer in Australia. Unless you believe in quantum entanglement where all sorts of marvellous things can happen and things can spontaneously happen, you know, because a butterfly flaps its wings there. Uh, if we forget about that for a while, um, quantum entanglement, then um, computers which are isolated don't break each other. Um, that's actually the same property that you need to make things <coughs> scalable. It, it, it's gluing them together that stops them from being scalable. If you want things to be scalable, they have to be isolated and you have to have lots of them. So if you want, like, how do you make, I always think it's completely crazy. Um, People make, um, they say, I want, the computer industry wants five nines reliability. That means 99.999% reliable. That's crazy. And they think that's good. Okay. So if you have one computer and the chance that it crashes is 10 to the minus 3, or 10 to the minus, it's about 10 to the minus 3 in a day, say, and you've got two independent computers, the probability they both crash is 10 to the minus 6. If you've got 100 computers, the probability is, is 10 to the minus 300. Okay, so you can make things arbitrarily reliable if you want to. So all this 10 to the minus, you know, 5, 9, it's complete rubbish. You know, because they haven't, just, they haven't made them isolated, they haven't split their computations in such a way that they can tolerate failures. If they do that, it's very simple to make very reliable systems. For Ericsson, for whom I work at the moment, uh, has made what I think is the most reliable system on the planet, which is, um, I think they measure, it was going up at nine nines, and it's never stopped, actually. It's a, an Erlang thing. Um, I asked them how long it had run for, and nobody actually knew if it had ever crashed. It had run for six years. Never crashed. We have a problem, really. They have training things, what to do if it crashes, and they go and leave these files, you know, if it crashes, like this, and they've never done it. So, you know, if it ever did crash. They wouldn't know what to do. So I feel like a mad scientist, you know, who turned on this computer. It just went over. So the computer should have an on button but no off button. It shouldn't have a stop there. They should evolve. Right. Hardware actually does uh, have isolation. Um, that's, that's actually, and concurrency is actually the reason why you can go into a catalogue and you can get different chips and stick them on a board. Get a soldering iron, solder them together, um, and it all works nicely. Software doesn't tend to work like that, okay? But we can make it work like that. That's not a problem. Ah, uh, this is the root of all evil: shared memory. Um, a lot of people, well, the dominant way of programming things like multiple computers uh, is using shared memory. Shared memory just means to processes can access the same memory space. Um, trouble with shared memory is it doesn't work in the presence of failures. 
if you assume, like in, in this top picture, that uh, a process sort of goes into some memory, does something, and comes out, that's fine. But what happens if it goes into this region and corrupts the memory and then crashes? Um, the, the red program is kind of responsible for this. The blue program might know that the red program has crashed, say, but it won't know what state it's left the memory in. So it can't actually recover from that or do anything sensible. So this ain't going to work at all. This is a very, very bad idea. Um, so you can't actually get shared memory and fault tolerance working together. In fact, the solution to this um, is something called transaction memories. Um, which is just about the most stupid idea I've ever, 